Buongiorno. Um, I thought that was great. Bello, che lui ha fatto. And um, I guess happiness has to do with how you get through the day, what you need to do to just get through the day. Uh, I brought some images of um, um, that we'll look at, and then we'll talk about what, what, uh, why I'm here. Uh, this image is uh, from 1981, and I'm standing next to a painting that I was working on on the beach. Uh, That's a picture of the same painting attached to the house on the beach. So I was trying to get back from it uh, lots of times when um, people are working or young artists, they're always complaining that they don't have enough space in their studio. Uh, they can't see what they're doing. I suggest they go outside and paint outside. They can get back further. They can use daylight. Uh, in 1978, I made a painting called The Patients and the Doctors. Uh, it's a painting with broken dishes um, that are glued on the surface. And uh, I was looking for a way to make a painting that I hadn't seen before. I was in a hotel room in Barcelona. I measured the closet and then I thought, okay, I'll go home and uh, I bought some plates at the Salvation Army, uh, broke them with a hammer and glued them down, and then uh, drew some images on top of that. That's uh, a little drawing for the, for the painting. Uh, that was in 1978. And these are some panels of paintings with broken dishes on them before I painted on them. So they're just like blank panels, but they kind of look like leaves or like nature in some way. Uh, I like to paint outside. Uh, this is a sculpture of mine. It's in the Alps, but it's a, it's a, it's a palm tree that's cast in bronze. It was from about um, uh, 20 years ago. On the other side, you can't really see it, but it says, I went to Tangiers and had dinner with Paul Bowles. Uh, I like the idea of uh, taking something that was from a tropical setting and placing it in a, in a glacial setting. There were uh, 18 sculptures that were put on the Chanterella in San Moritz on a, on a precipice out there that was left there for uh, a winter. Uh, and. Um, I think a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things have to do with displacement and looking at things in another context and realizing, um, and uh, uh, I think these things will become more evident as I get to the end of these images. Uh, so for example, here are some vases that were, I found in Tuscany in a, they were fake Etruscan vases that were in a, um, a what a fermiento, a fermiento, a, a hardware store, in a hardware store, in um, decorative vases in a hardware store. So I cast them in bronze again and I made them real again and made a sculpture where I stacked them on top of each other. That's in, uh, in, um, Good. A little bit of life. A fermento, a student ferment. Maybe they should come in. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> we will see. Okay. <laughs> no uh, problem. We are open anyway. Okay, we're open. Uh, uh, this is a bed that was made about 20 years ago. I think this is a bed I actually made for Johnny Versace. Uh, it's made out of bronze uh, and it's a uh, hot rolled steel. Now, a lot of the things that people have been talking about are made for uh, 
maybe mass consumption or for, uh, pr to produce, but all of the things that I made are one of a kind, or I made the bed for a friend of mine, or uh, it's not a, it's a, uh, they're, so they're handmade. This is a house that Addison Meisner designed in uh, the early part of the 20th century in Florida, was inspired by Italian and Moroccan uh, architecture. This is a house probably that looked like that before it was destroyed. And when I was in Egypt, I bought some sails from the Felucca sailors. And I thought, why should I make paintings out of rectangles? Uh, make them into rectangles when they had these incredible shapes that were the shapes of the sails. So I, one of the, the boats was called Jane. So the first notion that came to my mind was Birkin. So I called these the Jane Birkin paintings because I felt like that was a way of colloquializing Egypt. But you could kind of see the scale of the paintings. This used to be the ballroom of a man's house called Robert de Balcony. And then here are the same paintings that are transposed to another space. This is in the Palazzo Venezia in Rome. And um, so the notion of time is something that's very important to me. Uh, I don't see that we're going anywhere necessarily into the future. Uh, I think that there is no future. And I think that there's no past. I think there's just an eternal present and uh, that we live eternally. It can get augmented in different ways as we, as the eternity changes. But uh, when I was a child, my father uh, was driving to my aunt's house, and I would see these um, telephone poles. And then we'd pass them, and they would be behind us. And I'd say, well, that's the future. That's the past. That's the future. That's the past. Well, I never existed because I was in the car. So what I needed to do was stop time, so I started to make paintings in order to make the present that I could revisit. I think if you see a Caravaggio painting, you are in the present of that when you see it. If you saw the bicycle thief today and you never saw it before, you'd see it for the first time. If you saw it three times, you'd still see it for the first time because you'd be seeing it in your present. So. Uh, for example, this is a monastery from 1492 uh, that was in Seville. Uh, it, belong it was first a church, and then later it became uh, a barracks for the army. So I left everything in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the monastery, but I made some paintings and I put them on the walls. Uh, 24 stations of the cross instead of 14 stations. That's a painting called Cortez and another one called Blessed Clara. Uh, so obviously travel is something that's very, has been very important to me. This is, uh, there was a hole on the wall there. I hung the painting, The Teddy Bear's Picnic, in that wall without repainting it, without changing it, and you'd walk from one room to the next. Uh, somehow I guess we lost that picture of Cortez. Bart, it's the wrong, wrong P PDF? It doesn't matter. This is a house that, um, Stanford White built in 1882, uh, and I live in that house in the country. Uh, I paint out there also. That's the interior of the house, and there's a painting by Jacopo Vignelli from, I think it's uh, 1690. Uh, there's also a little painting of a found girl, uh, probably painted by her mother. I put a purple line through her eyes and a purple shape at the bottom, and later use that as a model to make some larger paintings. Maybe we'll see one of them later. But my father once asked me why I painted the girl's eyes out, and I said to him, so you'd look at her chin. I don't know how many people speak English here. Should I be talking in Italian? This is another image of the house, and those are two paintings that say, regarde mes pieds plats, which means look at my flat feet that are purple and green. Okay, this is a house that I built. 
Uh, it's a, s a studio and, uh, uh, and a clubhouse, so I could take the paintings inside. I work outside, um, and uh, this is n just a, okay, that's the inside of the house. So it looks quite old. It's made with a uh, live edge and, um, and uh, white cement and straw. I made the fireplace and the painting, the paintings that are inside I made also, and the tile. So sometimes somebody will say, uh, is this house uh, post-war? And I'd say, yeah. Um, the painting itself looks like it's made in the 17th century, except there's some white paint painted on it. Uh, I was once at um, uh, Giovanni Volpe's house in Venice, and he had all these paintings of procurators in his house that were family members. And all I wanted to do was put white paint on them, but obviously I couldn't destroy the paintings in his house, so I made my own antique paintings and then painted the white on them. Uh, this is another picture of the inside of that building. Some surfboards, actually, that I designed. Some I didn't, but I, I make surfboards also. I made that couch with a sawzall and a screw gun. And then um, I designed this building in, uh, and literally built the building uh, in New York City. I made a Venetian palazzo uh, on top of my building. And uh, it's basically two other people live in the building with me. And it's interesting because uh, uh, I think that you had a very excellent point that we didn't get very far with the sewing machine. Uh, a lot of people have forgot the uh, basic um, ways of working with stucco. Uh, we have four by eight sheets of, of plywood that are standardized, so we have very boring kind of rooms that people live in, and people are very accepting of those things because buildings get built quickly, uh, so they, they can make money. But I guess one thing that I've never tried to do is make money, and maybe that's good because uh, uh, if I did, the things wouldn't look the same. Uh, so anyway, I live in this building. Uh, and one thing that I really don't like, and what I kind of, uh, I look around and I see all these glass buildings globally all over, whether you're in uh, New York City or you're in Hong Kong or you're in uh, uh, Milan, if you're driving downtown, you, it looks like uh, the, the Pennzoil building in Houston, Texas. So. Uh, there's a kind of uh, generic homogeneity that's creeping globally all around, and people are using materials like glass in an extremely uh, accepting way that I find uh, extremely generic, innocuous, and boring. So I guess I made this building to pull the landscape of New York back a couple of... Um, uh, rewind a little bit, because this building looks older than the buildings that are in the neighborhood. Uh, this is inside the building, uh, some paintings of mine. I made the fireplaces, the floor, ceilings, and basically, uh, I, I think if I'm here because uh, it has anything to do with me being happy daily, I live in that house, I live in these places, I work in the way that I want to work, and I've been lucky enough to uh, uh, have a, an access to this door where I could paint things that are beyond logic, that have no reason other than the fact that I want to paint them. Um, so that painting you see on the left is a, a finger painting that I painted from the little painting you saw in the, in the other house, the found painting that uh, somebody's mother probably made. So this is the part of my living room. And then that's another floor in the building with another fireplace and some paintings that are painted on x-rays. So in 1911, there was a, I mean, I made a, I'm, I'm, I direct movies sometimes also, and I made a movie called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And uh, I finished shooting about 10, about 10 days early, so we needed another location. There was a lady who's, uh, grandfather was a doctor and they left him uh, an incredible house. They asked if I wanted to shoot there and I 
went to that house and found all these x-rays from 1911, which was the year my father was born, and I thought they looked like paintings to me. So I did the credits with those x-rays, and later I made them into paintings. So um, I see paintings everywhere. Uh, actually, that's a, that's a new painting that I painted about two weeks ago. It's a pity to look at it on that screen. I might see it better up there. So, for example, let's talk about that for a minute, and let's talk about time. Okay, in 1850, there's the four wallpaper of, um, of uh, George Washington accepting Cornwallis's surrender at, um, uh, at, for the freedom of the United States. So they think that there's something going on here. Uh, there was a goat that I had, a stuffed goat in my office with a, a, a bunny rabbit on his head. So I put the image of the rabbit and the goat on top of George Washington and Cornwallis. And then uh, after painting outside for many years, I, it's a habit I have, so I put ink on here and I took a hose. And with the hose, I modified the way the ink dried so it looks like these crazy clouds. These people that are surrendering or winning have no idea what the future brings or what reality is really there. And Muhammad Ali once said, uh, he called something the goat, which was greatest of all time. I think that was just a coincidence that I found this goat. But uh, I was very satisfied with the way that, let's see if I go back. There's another one of those pictures of the way the goat became the protagonist and some sort of, I think the goat probably has to do with eternity in some way. There's a great book that I suggest that everybody read. It's called In the Hand of Dante by Nick Tosh. And if you have any questions about eternity, God, yourself, your own dignity, whatever your possibilities are, he might answer those questions for you. And gangsters also. Uh, these are some drawings I made for my second wife, and uh, I, I made that fireplace also. This was on the sixth floor of the building. Ah. Uh, Here's a chair that I made the other day. It's made out of bronze. Uh, that was the drawing for the chair. So essentially I took the, uh, uh, I made it out of wood and clay and then I cast it in bronze and put this little trim on it with the little, what are they, pom-poms and, and, and this velvet and I pa hand painted it. And that's a painting from about 20 years ago on a Feluca sale. Um, I think that's all of the images. Yeah, okay, so we could turn that. Let's find an image. I love. Let's, we'll stay with this one. Um, so I look at things, and I find that I have a hard time with it, so I have to build my own reality. And, uh, and maybe that's the whole premise or why I might be here that somebody and maybe everybody that's on this panel is has done that in some way uh, just try to build their own reality where they could sit in a room where the light is not too bright or they could control the sound of where they live uh, and uh, maybe just offer another possibility of uh, everything that I think I did, uh, the house that I wanted to build was, uh, the, they try to stop me from doing that. Uh, I think people try to stop you all the time from making art. Uh, they'll offer you something to make a movie for less money than you could do it for, uh, and then you have to learn how to say no, as much as you have to learn how to say yes. But I think that, um, I don't know if there's any reason for me to be here, in fact. But I was extremely happy uh, to see, what's your first name, Vladimir, is it? Uh, what he was thinking and, and what he was doing, because um, there's two ways of doing something. There's one way of going out into the world and, and doing something that could be useful in, in, in some kind of way. And then there's another way of looking at the world, and you look into your corner. And you're just looking into that corner, and in that corner you could find something that could open another kind of world for other people if they could kind of look into that corner also. So I think that 
there are different permutations of life. I do it one foot behind the next, but I do it by myself. And uh, uh, so I've never, so I was asked some questions that I've, I've never tried to uh, um, uh, produce or, or mass market any of the things that, uh, any of the furniture that I've made or any of those things that just, um, felt like if I built it a specific way and built it the way that I liked it for myself that it would be okay for somebody else. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>